As the ice age ended, the melting water and the washed up gravel deposits changed the landscape around the Alps, creating substantial areas covered with lakes, moors and other bodies of water. These sites were already settled in the Mesolithic, but it was the following Neolithic when a special type of settlement was built around the Alps, pile dwellings. These wooden settlements were raised on carrying posts that were used as stabilization in wet environments, usually on shallow waters or occasionally flooded areas. A single village could include 5 to 80 houses. Up to 500 people lived in larger settlements. They were made of densely placed sheds or smaller houses with gabled tops. Some of these pile dwellings were additionally encompassed with a wooden palisade wall. Around 1,000 settlements have been found around the Alps. Archaeologists identified that up to 25 villages could lie above or next to each other in a small area. Many of the settlements evolved spontaneously from individual houses built by pioneers, others were planned and built at the same time. Besides the unique settlement structure, the pile dwellings are also special because they offer us more archaeological remains, which have been preserved thanks to the watery ground that prevented access of oxygen, slowing the decay process. This enabled archaeologists to also find organic remains, like plant-based food, textile and wood artifacts. Great care went into selecting the type of wood based on the properties best suited for the manufacture of an architectural component, tool or a vessel. The most commonly used types were oak, fir, ash, alder, willow, poplar, lime and birch woods. Due to the consistent presence of moisture and other natural factors, the lifespan of the pile dwelling hut was no more than 20 years, meaning it had to be consistently maintained. Because wood was such an important raw material for the inhabitants of the pile dwellings, the forests were intensively used, and this had a lasting impact on the composition and development of the wooded area surrounding the lakeside settlements. And what did the pile dwellers eat? The hunting, gathering and fishing was supplemented with farming, both with animal husbandry, especially cattle, goats and sheep, and with agriculture. Cereals like wheat, barley, amber and uncorn were the most common type of crop they raised, supposedly even to produce beer. Peas and flax were also cultivated and were later joined by spelt, millet, broad beans and lentils. In some sites, archaeologists also discovered traces of hallucinogens like nightshade and blackthorn. They gathered local nuts and berries, but also roots and herbs for their medical properties. Pile dwellers were also familiar with grapevine and other types of fruit and vegetables. They made different porridges and stews and probably baked woods as well. Plants were also used for hunting, as pile dwellers added poisonous yew needles to their arrowheads. They hunted stags, deer, boars, beavers, otters and water birds. Foods were not always thoroughly prepared though, and people were often victims of diseases and parasitic infections. Different plants like flax and marsh grass were also used to create fibers. The fabric could also be dyed using pigments. Bleached linen is obtained by cooking linen in beech or oak ashes, red coloring in young elm ashes, yellow in crab apple ashes, and black in hazel tree leaves. Delicate fishing nets were made, but also robust ropes, which were probably used chiefly in timber construction. The sometimes very fragile remnants also help us reconstruct some of the steps in the process of textile manufacturing. Implements including spindles and spindle whorls, loom weights and combs were all used as part of this process. Mats, bags and baskets, as well as hats, shoes, capes and belts were among the textile finds recovered from pile dwelling sites. Bone and antler were used to manufacture a wide range of objects, like woodwork and leatherwork tools. Antler was not only obtained from hunting, shed antlers could also be utilized. Because of its elasticity, antler is a material suitable for making axe sleeves. Pieces of antler fitted between the stone axe blades and the wooden hefts to absorb the shock to the wood and impact and avoid damage to the tools. Jewelry items including combs, pins, pendants and beads were also made of bone, antler and animal teeth. The pile dwellers were among the first metal workers in the area. However, stone tools made out of chert continue to be crafted and used side by side with the metal ones. In the millennia-long process of metal replacing stone, the style of copper tools often imitated that of stone tools. Same tool, different material. 
While the stone product was harder, it was also more susceptible to chipping and damage. Copper could be recast or reforged, but the expensive cost most probably made it a symbol of status and prestige first and foremost. The smithies were usually placed at the edge of a settlement even back then, both because of the danger of fire and, presumably, because founders and smiths had a special status in their community due to their extensive knowledge, skill and the ability of manipulating materials from one state and one shape to another. The copper products were created by placing the crucible with pieces of copper into a charcoal pit. Pile dwellers used bellows to provide oxygen and therefore a high enough temperature, even above 1000 degrees Celsius, for the copper to melt. They then poured the melted copper into molds, following with forging the product into its final form. This process was used for most tools and items, though some products demanded more advanced techniques. Such was the case with some axes, which were cast in closed two-piece molds. Weapons of the Copper Age were used both for hunting as well as combat and warfare. From the end of the 4th millennium BC, gaps in the human settlement began appearing across Central Europe. It is believed that they were caused by climate change, which in turn caused crop failure, famine, disease and hostile raids. Several cultures of the 3rd millennium BC, like those of Corded Ware and Belbicre cultures, have revealed the grave goods that suggest the existence of a warrior class. Such items were also found at the pile dwelling sites, bone pieces of armor, axes and arrowheads. Genetic analysis of the cemeteries of the Belbicre and Cordware cultures indicate a change in the European population by migration from the east, especially from the area of the Pitgrave or Yamnaya culture. This change is likely associated with the first arrival of Indo-European languages arriving in Central and Western Europe. Eventually, metallurgy developed to the point that the new go-to material became bronze, the alloy made of copper and tin. While copper is prevalent in many parts of Europe, tin is much rarer material, which led to further enhanced trade routes across the continent. With bronze, the casting process became easier because the resulting alloy had a lower melting point. It also allowed craftsmen to devise new uses and create new types of tools, since bronze is harder than copper. Not just metalwork, but pottery as well demonstrates the great craftsmanship skills pile dwellers possessed. It is through pottery of pile dwellers that we can separate their individual culture groups that stretch across space and time. The examples range from plain, simple vessels to intricate artistic ones. Archaeologists have identified more than 30 cultural groups within the area of pile dwellings. The abundant clay was extracted from the surrounding area and then mixed with crushed stone, ground fire clay, straw, dung, seashells or ground bone. These tempering agents reduced the shrinking of the clay during drying and increased its resistance to cracking. Small vessels were made of flattening lumps of clay to shape the vessel walls. More elaborate and larger containers were created using coils of clay. Vessel surfaces could be compacted and polished to a shine using a smooth stone. Patterns were impressed and incised using either one's fingers or a tool made of wood or bone. The vessels were fired either in an open fire or in a pit. The latter method allowed a potter to better control the oxygen supply and temperature during the firing process. The smallest and most robust of vessels are assumed to have been made as children's toys, perhaps even by other youths that only started learning the craft. Rattles were also used, be it as toys or to create music. Among children, the mortality rate was presumably still very high, as it was throughout prehistoric and ancient times. No graves or cemeteries of pile dwellers were found. The closest is the natural mummy called Etsy, who was found in the Central Alps, which were already surrounded by pile dwellings at the time. Another indicator of the developed cultural life are the figural depictions created by the pile dwellers. These were a rare phenomenon in the 3rd millennium BC in Europe, but give us a precious insight into the attire of pile dwellers as well as their spiritual life. It is not entirely clear who or what these figurines represented. They range from female shape to a masked, beaked humanoid that could represent a sky deity. Perhaps the figurines were used in a religious ritual. Rattles and other figurines also depicted animal forms. The patterned pottery and idols could also represent celestial bodies and constellations like Orion, Cassiopeia and Northern Cross. According to some experts, the figurines represent or were at least inspired by the Orion constellation, 
which had a significant role in the religion of ancient Egypt, as well as Greek mythology. The beaked humanoid perhaps indicates connection to ducks or swans who shared the habitat of pile dwellers. The constellation of the swan, Cygnus, was also important for the ancient Greeks who associated it with Apollo. There are more possible connections between the contemporary cultures stretching from Britain to Mesopotamia, but we cannot be certain if and how these distant religious beliefs and cultures were all linked. What we can be certain of is that between the Great Pyramids, Stonehenge, Ziggurats and the artifacts of Wuchedol culture, all peoples paid attention to the sky. No wonder, as they were all agriculture-based society and had greatest interest in predicting seasons, weather and tracking the passage of time. They all had an extensive knowledge of physics, geometry and astronomy, and it is all this knowledge that the pile dwellers had to utilize to create one of the most important artifacts they left us, the oldest wheel in the world. While the wooden wheel found in Ljubljana marshes is the oldest wheel we have discovered, this doesn't mean that its creation originated here and then spread around the world, but rather that such technology developed simultaneously across different cultures from Europe to Caucasus, Mesopotamia and China. There are older depictions of the wheels on wagons and clay toys that utilized wheels, but the wheel of Ljubljana marshes is indeed the oldest practical wheel that we have found so far. The combination of dendrochronology and carbon dating determined that the wheel and its axle are around 5,200 years old. It was found during the research of a pile-dwelling settlement at Staregmeine, near Vrhnica in 2002. Besides the remains of the wheel, a separated axle has also been found. The wheel was composed of two ashwood plates that were connected by four oak wedges. The choice of ashwood was not coincidental because of its strength and because it grew in the vicinity. The axle was constructed from one piece of oak wood and was 124 cm long. The wheel is surprisingly accurate and extremely skillfully constructed. The manner of attachment and joining point to an exceptionally skilled master craftsman. The wheel was most probably a part of a two-wheeled cart pulled by oxen. These were used around the settlements and not for long-distance travel, as the absence of roads and swaths of impassable terrain would have made such a journey risky. A cart would have been especially useful for the wood transport from the surrounding forests for the continuously required maintenance of the settlements. As for the long-distance journeys, the easiest and most used method was probably through waterways, across which pile dwellers moved on their up to 12 meters long dugout canoes. The presence of before-mentioned Etsy in the heart of the Alps also suggests that contemporary Europeans were no strangers to long travels across the mountains. Although there were no roads, the prehistoric people traversed the distances that spanned hundreds of kilometers. This is proven by important items and raw materials that arrive from as much as 500 kilometers away. It is especially impressive that pile dwellers, these people supposedly unfamiliar with math, writing or measurement systems, were able to construct such a wheel made of complex, uneven pieces that, when joined together, formed a working wheel and axle. And how did the pile dwelling settlements end? The truth is that not many of them held on for a long time. It was actually quite common that the settlement lasted for a couple of decades, some up to a century, but were then abandoned. Some of these showed traces of fire or flood or some other disaster, be it natural or man-made, that forced the inhabitants to move out. Eventually, a new pile-dwelling site rose up nearby or even on top of a former settlement. The last alpine pile-dwellers lived on the legs of the transition from the Bronze into the Iron Age. When lake levels began to decline, people settled on nearby hills or established lowland villages. Not just the oldest wheel, but the oldest musical instrument has also been found in Slovenia. To learn more about it and how the Stone Age people lived before settling on the pile dwellings around the Alps, click on the next video or link in the description below. Be sure to like, subscribe, you know how YouTube works, and I will bring you more history soon.